All right, we're live. Okay. Who are you? I am Fred Schendel. I am Steve Babb. And we are Glass Hammer. Yay. You can tell we're, we're really, we, we should be more excited about this because we haven't done an interview in a long time and it sounds like we're not excited. I'm so let's... thrilled. Okay. I am just, uh, my, I'm about to explode. Will there be a video component to this, uh, this interview? Well, if you're looking at the screen right now, you probably see a picture of our two heads. And uh, we it, tried three times to do a video interview, and it was foiled. And we took it as a uh, as a sign yep. not to do that. No, not going to do it. And uh, but now this is these are different questions. These, these come from our Facebook fans. Oh, we, we didn't uh, finish talking about. Oh, the, the picture. Yeah. Well, if you watch closely, uh, just so that there'll be some excitement visually, at some point. I'm not going to tell you when, but at some point, that photo is going to change. And when it does... But only for like a frame? Is it going to be fast? No, it's not a subliminal. No, okay. no, it's just going to... Something's going to happen, okay? So there visually, be, something is going to happen. Will there be cash prizes? If no. You, oh. No. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And, oh, and then maybe, maybe, at the end of the interview or somewhere near the end, there'll be a special bonus picture. Will that involve cash prices? I'll, no, there will well, be no cash. Why involved. is anybody going to listen to this? Because <laughs> at least a few people had no, some questions, and, and well, I think they're okay, going to listen then. to our answer. Well, that sounds... So this was posted on uh, what date? doesn't matter. It's on Facebook on our page, the Glass Hammer page. And Bill asks us, he says, don't know if it was mentioned in previous updates, but what was the inspiration for the album title? Well, the album title he's referring to is Cor Cordium, which... Can uh, you spell that? Yes, I can. C-O-R-C-O-R-D-I-U-M. I'm looking at it on the screen here, so it's not so hard. And that album title I found online. It was my turn to name the album. Did we ever determine if it's Cor Cordium or Cor Cordium? I'm sure one of our fans will let us know. I think I know the one. Huh? I think I know who... Who it'll be? Yeah, yeah, there's some Latin scholars in okay. our audience. All right, moving on. Okay, so it's an epitaph to uh, Percy Shelley. It means heart of hearts. And some other people have asked who knew Latin, uh, why is there a picture of a flying brain on the cover of the album when it's about when it's called a heart of hearts? Because that's what he drew. That's what he drew, and it's and once you hear the album. It will all make sense. There you are. So the next question. Why is there pictures of rocks on Inconsolable Secret? Yeah, that's we, maybe a secret. Yeah. Because that's what, that's he, what drew. he drew. That's what he drew. Okay. Uh, Al- and we Alvis, liked it. Alvis Hill says, You guys seem to have hit a groove with your current lineup. In your preceding discussions, in your pre-recording discussions, I bet you said something like, what do we want to do different this time? Could you give us some insights? Well, we did to some extent. I don't know that we, I mean, we didn't like bring out the whiteboard and make a chart and have bullet points. No, but I think we're going to do, but we kind of knew we did hit something really magical with if, and I, I think it would have. We didn't want to try to recreate it. We just wanted to do something brand new with the same group in the same general direction. So we didn't. We knew the album was going to evolve differently because everybody was in on the ground floor of this one, which wasn't quite the case the last time around. We had had a whole lot of music pretty much written by the time that Alan and John came on board. They had a chance to make contributions in terms of arrangement. And John had some melodic ideas and. I think managed to get in some lyrics, some lyric ideas, but there was still a pretty tight framework because the music was essentially down. So we knew we were going to have a little bit more flexibility this time around to entertain ideas a bit more democratically from an earlier stage. And I think that that's fairly apparent when you listen to this album, that there's places that have something of a different tone. It's obviously still us and it still gets filtered through the same sensibility so it's not like it's some kind of radical difference but um i think you can say that uh that there's a different feel in places and i think it it sounds more like a band effort yeah i mean and admittedly say the difference between culture of ascent and 
There's the phone. No, we didn't think of fixing that little problem. Hold on. We'll be back. All right, we're back. We were talking about the direction of the album, whether oh, we yeah. had any conscious ideas. Going and then ahead. the phone rang and mm-hmm. my mind blew. Right. So, yeah, there was a big difference between Culture of Scent and Three Cheers for the Broken Heart. Hearted, and com- and there was a, an obvious choice to change directions there, but I don't think we could say that happened. This it's, we're, it's a continuation. Yeah, it is, but I think we had a bit of a mandate in our heads to try to make this album rock a little more. Yeah, and I think in terms of dynamics, it actually goes from uh, greater bits of sort of pastoral, soft prettiness to bits of heaviness and there were some things like that and we did say that we wanted to hear alan yeah more in the mix. definitely Maybe. give alan and that's another case of him coming in in the early stages and we had a lot more ability to make guitar prominent and and we wanted to make sure that john had more of a chance to really exert his uh personality as a vocalist and let's see next question is from daniel our very good friend daniel and um, he says, when is it going to be available? I probably missed the announcement. Got mine ordered with signatures. I'm very excited. So, Daniel, you were so excited that you did not read the release date. And that's just a short answer. It's October 25th. Mark your calendar. 2011. And um, shame on you for not reading the fine print, Daniel. Okay, but we're going to get it out as fast as we can. Chris McIntosh, otherwise known as Grandfather Rock. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. Are there any thoughts of taking this thing on the road? Careful what you say, Fred. Yes. We've been talking about how we can get out and play live. Uh, We're excited about the idea. Most of us are excited about the idea. Yeah, I think. Okay, so the truth is uh, this is something we waffle on frequently. I'm not sure how that translates. But we do talk about it. We would like to do it. Um, we're never really willing to take away time from the studio work of Glass Hammer to do it. Right. But should the right opportunities present themselves in 2012, and there are a few opportunities on, that you know, are out there uh, percolating, if that happens... Then yeah, I think we'll go. We'll go out and play. If if not, we'll, we'll yeah. play. And we and we want to be well rehearsed, and we want to get out there with the show that will absolutely blow people away. We don't want to just kind of fling it together and hope for the best. We want to go out and play this music like we've been playing it for the last twenty years. You're still, you know, you're talking about, and I think in the case of a lot of progressive rock acts now, you're taking you're taking a studio group, yeah, mm-hmm. and you're trying to turn it into a live group where both Fred and I both have extensive experience playing in live bands and that are dedicated to playing live. And it's a completely different experience. Uh, studio bands dive out on stage and it's very difficult. You have to, to learn to play your own material. You have to learn to play you your actually, own songs. It's like being a cover band. You've got to pull out the album and figure out what you did and how you did it and if you can do it again. So we, you know, we did this a couple times. We did it really big with our Tivoli show and our Belmont show and people flew in and came from all over the world just to see it so when you people do that kind of thing for us then it makes us really want to do it right or not do it at all exactly but I'm thrilled about the idea of going out and being able to play some of this I think it'd be we're game yeah and and hopefully in Europe that would be even better yeah. because that's not happened yet nope. uh, Michael asks do the songs on core cordium or core cordium tell a story or follow a common theme any plans on making more concept albums in the future you snuck in a second question michael but that's okay Mm -hmm. so do is there a common theme do they tell a story yeah i I think we when we came out of if which wasn't was also not really a concept album it just kind of played out that way but it this album for me lyrically was going to be more like a shadowlands album where the songs are not tied together However, that being said, uh, by the time Fred had contributed his lyrics and I had contributed mine and John had contributed his, there were a couple of themes. Uh, They're going to sound gloomy when I tell you what they are, but um, I think you're going to really like the music anyway, uh, regardless of the themes, and that is 
There's a couple of songs that are about isolation, and that would be Nothing Box, mm -hmm. which you're going to love, and She a Lonely Tower. Uh, maybe I would even say Salvation Station, which is kind of about just being trapped in a in a world of commercial TV, I think. And and then the other theme expressed in Dear Daddy uh, and One Heart are about saying goodbye uh, and to to loved ones specifically. So there's if you want to say that. Yeah, I guess there's some, a theme that's in there, but it was not intentional. <laughs> so the themes are death and loneliness. Yeah. But it's actually a pretty upbeat album. I think it is. Because at yeah. the end of all those things, there's usually you know, redemption and another life and togetherness. Togetherness, exactly. So and Glass just Hammer album. Dark Before the Dawn. Exactly. And I th we will never fail, I think, in that regard. Glass Hammer albums, regardless of whether they go into dark places or not, they are ultimately about redemption. Okay, now, Al, Al Shiko. Now, this is not Alan Shiko. This is another Al Shiko hmm. asks, where did you find that awesome guitarist? <laughs> and so Al, uh, Al is Alan's dad. And oh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> he is an awesome guitarist. And um, we found him working on a recording with uh, a local jazz group. At, yeah, at, he had been church. involved uh, in things we'd done prior to that. Yeah, we've known him for years. I yeah. Think. He was a kid. and But it was really maybe the, the jazz duo project. It was kind of a Pat Metheny, Lyle Mays fusion uh, thing he did with a uh, keyboard player who's really good, who's since left and gone to Florida. But uh, he did go to Florida, right? Yeah, he did go Not to Not that that's relevant. I don't know why I'm telling you that. But um, at some point, after realizing that we were, again, without a guitar player, uh, we realized that, hey, you know, there's actually somebody that has the ability and is certainly a great person would be fun to work with. Just he's kind of a jazzer. Would he be interested in the kind of thing that we're doing? And it turned out, yeah, actually, he's... Very interesting. He he knew basically what Prague was, had a passing interest in it, and was totally interested in kind of diving more into progressive guitar players and seeing what they were all about, and just thinks it's great. And uh, he's came become on. the ultimate student of Prague rock. Yeah, he really, really does his homework. And he also really, really likes '80s pop, but we probably shouldn't even talk about that. No, we've tried to steer him. He's away really good that. at it. But we don't allow that into our recordings. Maybe no, we don't. Else. Even but though no, he's a great, well-rounded guitar player, and he uh, he he knows Pat Metheny backwards and forwards, and he's uh, all about um, Alan Holdsworth, and now he's getting to be all about Steve Howe and Steve Hackett. So it's a great, th and he's got great ideas, and uh, his ability to take things that keyboard players write and big chunky blocky chords and revoice them in interesting horizontal ways on a guitar is pretty much what we've always hoped that we would get so yeah. it's really working out well yeah yay alan yeah and um now jp jp wentz he's got three but one's not really core cordium related okay we'll give you one okay he says question number one i as much as i've enjoyed your latest works I've really been yearning for a new album that harkens back to the 2000 and earlier sound, particular, particularly on to Evermore. Hmm. Is there any chance of Glasshammer pursuing this, or is the if core core diem sound here to stay? That's question one. Ooh, that's well, that's a little landmine or land minefield, isn't it? It is. I, I'll give you the short answer, JP. I'm glad you like those albums, but anything prior to 2000. Uh, to me, is in a completely different chapter for us. I, yeah. I kind of view Glass Hammer as, you know, chapter one is the, the '90s, chapter two being the the Near Fest group and Shadowlands inconsolable group, and then uh, w with a obvious chapter three being uh, what we've done with uh, with John and Alan recently. And so, I'm I'd have to say we're going to move forward. Yeah. Um... I mean, we never, we know we change from time to time and reinvent things a little bit. But at this point, 
with these people, there's definitely kind of an organic direction that emerges out of it. And I think we're going to stay at least to a large degree in that vein, even though we may change things up a little bit within that framework. I think that the template of what we're doing right now is going to remain largely unchanged while we have this ban, which we're kind of hoping it's going to be for a while. We never say never. You never quite know what's going to happen no. in the future. Lives but, change. Uh, people, yeah. people move on, but we're very happy with our situation at present. And right now, I think we're really just kind of looking forward to the ultimate uh, statement or the ultimate uh, like pinnacle of the direction we're trying to take. We're already talking about the next album and how it can be the biggest, craziest most proggy thing that ever progged with a capital P in a you know big progified universe. I think so, yeah. But that's, that's where we're that's going. next time. Right now, let's yeah. deal with this. Uh, his second question: In Glasshammer's history, the musician lineup has rarely stayed put for over a couple of albums. Is the if Core Cordium Glasshammer's new permanent lineup, and he puts permanent in quotes, or is it just another phase? And Fred pretty much, Fred really answered that just then. I think. Uh, we're we're happy. John's happy. Alan's happy, and and we're sticking to the program. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, question three: Any chance of inconsolable revisited ever seeing the light of day? And what he's asking uh, that some of you know is that the inconsolable secret is out of print, and there has been talk for years that Fred and I were dabbling with new mixes and remixes. Um, that we were not happy with the original and that we wanted to put out something different. And as we talked about it, new projects would come up and so it would kind of get put on the shelf again for a little while. And But then we would read fan mail and the fan mail, you know, was very upfront that said, why would you change this thing? Why, why would you change it? And yeah, there, there certainly was some excitement out there for the idea but there was a strong backlash yeah that you know it is what it is why would they want to mess with it it's great the same kind of thing that's happened to other artists when they've gone back and tried to revisit their work there's always a dedicated bunch of people that liked it and my attitude was simply that we're not going to withdraw the original that this would just be an alternative but when we started doing that it was in a little bit of a void where the band was practically on hiatus and it just seemed like a good project to keep us occupied but out of you know, John came along specifically for that. Right. And we wound up realizing that you know, we could forge ahead and do new material instead of just reworking the old material, and that became the focus. Once and long and long ago Before the tales that men no know There were tales of deeds done I could see that since we did do a certain amount of work on it, that maybe we'll make it available in some form or put it out there as a download just so people can check it out. Yeah, but, the, the current idea for that whole uh, thing is is to go ahead and re-release The Inconsolable Secret perhaps sometime in 2012, just as it was. But the added bonus material on the, enha- the enhanced disc is going to contain really good... Uh, remixes yeah, so with John. Flack files are the two songs yeah, or three the, songs that we managed to get somewhere on. Yeah, Susie had, had re-sung some vocals uh, but actually sang Maker of Crowns as she did with us live. Yeah. So there's there's a few songs that we'd like you to hear because, I mean, they're more the way we would have heard them originally but we're not going to change the inconsolable secret. I think that's pretty much... Yeah, and hopefully that'll maybe appeal to everybody. The purists that want it in their original form, they're going to get that. And the people that were kind of excited about an update, you'll get a chance to check that out. So now here's the, here's the question that's uh, going to wrap this up, except I will go ahead and say that JP, he comes back at the end of this thread on Facebook and says, you guys should start a PID cast. <laughs> and I'm not quite familiar with, the term PID cast. You kids and your PIDs. Yeah, you kids and your PIDs. Um, yeah, well, Always something new we have to get a, up with. This is kind of a PID cast, isn't it? It kind of is. Okay. We, we right. count, I think. This could be the first ever official Glass Hammer PID cast. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Okay, but here's a big long one from, uh, um, or a big question from Craig Haynes. 
And Craig's question is, the influence of Yes is probably felt the most in the CD If, which caused listeners to respond with either, quote, I love the strong Yes influence, or, quote, the Yes influence is too much, so I'll pass, end of quote. Do these polarized views have any influence on the writing of Core Cordium? And then when writing a new album, does the band intentionally set out to reflect the musical influences of other bands like Yes? Or do you just write and those musical influences just naturally come out? Well, I'd love to answer that, but uh, we're out of time and I have to go. Yeah, uh, there's other, other issues. No, no, no. 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 We're going to answer just... that, Craig. Um, I will that's, tell that's you. actually seven, several questions. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll give it a go. Um, so I don't think there was as much controversy as some forums might lead you to believe. Um, when we discovered John, it was primarily because of his background in a Yes tribute band. And so Fred and I thought, let's have fun with this. Yeah. And we did. And it's he, like we... we we love Yes. John Anderson has always been one of our favorite singers, and we found a guy favorite, that could yeah. do it. And I don't think it was so much a case of let's consciously sound like Yes. As in a couple places, we could hear that happening where it's like, well, let's not shy away from it. Let's just let's go fun. for it. Yeah. Let's do it. Because yeah. at that point, uh, the new Yes album wasn't even being discussed back when we were working on If. I mean, there, there was no recording version of Yes. And uh, it was, actually, I... I like the album. I like Fly From Here, but their new singer sounds to my ears more like Trevor Horn, really, than John mm -hmm. Anderson. So there's still not necessarily a progressive rock band out there with that voice. And we just thought it would be kind of fun to uh, give people a little taste of that here and there, and for ourselves, too. We like to hear it. We certainly didn't set out to make a Yes album. I'm doing air quotes right now. Yeah, I don't think that we did. Nope. And... I get defensive about it sometimes because I'll listen to it and I think this sounds nothing like yes at all. And if you listen to the way the songs are written, most of the time, it really doesn't. You can hear a lot of influences in it. Um, and then I'm defensive and then I realize, no, wait a minute, I really am a fan of yes and I kind of mm -hmm. like this. So I'm on the fence about it. Yeah, but, in little spots. There were places where uh, we'd be trying to come up with a good guitar part for a section and Alan would kind of, would dial up a Steve Howe sound and go, listen to this. And we kind of all laugh. And then we'd talk about, okay, no, we can't do that. That's just too much. Or occasionally we look at each other and go, oh, that sounds so cool. Let's just do it. It's Any a fun thing. And people will know exactly where it came from, but let's do it because it fits, it's appropriate, and we like it, and it makes our brains giggle. And there's so, no lying about right. this. We are Yes fans, mm -hmm. and we are ELP fans, and we are Camel fans, and we're fans of a number of things. And Yes influences certainly come to the fore when you put somebody like John Davison in the lineup. That being said, there's a lot of other things that John does with his voice, and he does them on Cor Cordium. Yeah, and we really tried to uh, consciously make sure that he had more of a uh, personal voice on this, and he wasn't just kind of being, hey, that guy that sounds like John Anderson. There are still moments. I mean, if he goes up high you're going to get a certain amount of that. We still have a couple places where we go, huh, there's John. But mm -hmm. uh, there's, I mean, we really encouraged, we never looked at him and said, no, you need to make that sound a little bit more like John Anderson. It's like, no, it just needs to sound like you. No, yeah. worry about it. And I think he does. And um, Same in the guitar department. And then do when we write, I guess, or when writing a new album, do, do we intentionally set out to reflect our influences? I No. I would say no. Nope. It's the same thing. Sometimes it comes out organically and we decide... I think we can get away with this. Let's leave it like that. Or sometimes we go, no, nah, we better tweak that. So there are places where it just happens and we let it go, but only places. And occasionally I'll write something and then later on down the road, I'll think about it and go, well, okay, that actually does sound a bit like X. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably a, one of the biggest fans of this band. I'll just admit it. I love our music and I love the work that we've done and I'm proud of it. Uh, when I listen to it, I I really want to champion the idea that Glass Hammer has its own sound, that we do emulate and show the influences from bands that were recording in a very short period of time back in the 70s um, 
and we do that unabashedly, I think. Yeah, I mean, lots of things creep in. It's not just yes. Occasionally we'll go, oh, there's Keith, you know, Keith Emerson. And sometimes we go, hey, there's Rick. And we hope a lot of time you go, you don't think about that at all. And you just listen and it's original and it's us and it's not. No. And I think we... But we're we, happy to be retro. We do share some common threads with yes that probably come out too. And that is a love for pipe organs and, and, and mini mogs and, mm-hmm. and tenors. And big choral parts, and uh, because that we have the same backgrounds they do in church music, that's part of it. And yeah, it's expressed in rock. So that's about it, I think. Um, maybe you got a surprise picture. Maybe you didn't. We'll just have to look at the video. Yeah, that's in the future for us. So we yeah, don't know. yeah, we don't know. I haven't edited this, and we'll just have. It to might have all turned out to be a cruel lie. Yeah, maybe so. And if this. Uh, ends up creating another interview with more questions before the release we'll be happy to to talk to you what we could do something very yes like with this video we could have just a nature like stock footage bam going in the background little droplets dripping in pools of water and forest i got a wind in the leaves okay i can do a forest kind of things that uh John Anderson would have liked to have had in his videos there you go Uh, we're doing it again we're doing it again aren't we yeah Oh, well. It's a fun idea. I think we should do it. Thanks for hanging out on our Facebook page, and thanks for all the encouraging uh, posts and emails, and we look forward to the release, um, and look forward to hearing what you guys think about it, and we hope that you're going to love Core for the End. It's it's the work that we've done in 2011, and we're anxious to get it out there and get it to you. So you can hear it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.